Hello everybody, it is Rocco, your boy here, your professor of the hour, coming at you again with another Age of Sigmar 101 episode. Today we're doing, what are the parts of a battle round? And I'm going to walk you through the theory and concepts needed uh, for you to understand what the hell goes on during a battle round, and then we're going to go with a live example of the battle round. And I know we've been shouted out on Warhammer Weekly two weeks in a row at this point. I'm going to be hoping for three, but, eh, you know, I'll take playing Soulbound with them on Mr. Mephisto's channel. You know, I, I don't want to push my luck too much. So, I'm going to take an idea from them because I just am so inspired. We are going to be doing a slideshow. This will be the uh, parts of a battle round for second edition of Age of Sigmar. And first, uh, first things first, the hero phase. Yeah, we do the start of the hero phase, get your command point for showing up. It's free. That if there's any endless spells running around, you have a chance to unbind them. You generally waste a wizard's casting attempt to try to do it, but maybe you've got heroes with abilities that could do it instead. And then, buff your own army. Whether it's abilities, spells, prayers, buff your army, debuff your opponent, hurt them, cause some damage. And then double check to see if there's anything else you can do. Because there's command abilities on almost every hero. Never hurts to check. Movement phase. The uh, beginning of the movement phase is my favorite phase. So some armies have teleports at the beginning of the movement phase. I'm thinking off the top of my head like Sylvaneth have a unit that can do it. Uh, some happen during the movement phase. Which also leads to normal movement. So if there's an ability that says hey. Do this with normal movement, like say you fly over something and cause the mortal wounds with normal movement. This is now movement phase. That's the that's the word. Work with me or follow me, camera guy. Then this could be when we run by adding a D6 to their movement characteristic on their war scroll. Retreating out of combat. Again, roll that D6. It's free movement. And if you don't like the run rolls you get, you can spend a command point from one of your heroes if they're in range and automatically make that a six. And then, after that is, well, the end of movement. This is usually where armies that can summon troops, like most of the Chaos, uh, all the Chaos armies can, uh, come in now. There's, if someone deep strikes, this is when you do that too, generally. End of the movement phase, come in from reserve, whether it's from a table edge, whether it's from anywhere on the board. Either way, it's nine inches away from your stuff. And then also teleports can occur here as well, depending on the army. Shooting phase, Jack from Rerolling One's favorite phase here, the guru of shoot you. Uh, start of the shooting phase, spend a command point to buff your stuff. Rerolling One's to hit there with volley fire is awesome on, say, a unit of long strikes that hit on a two. If you have any buffs to hit or wound that aren't spells, because you've already would have done them by now, do them here. It's great. During the shooting phase, shoot them. Moving on. Charge phase, start of the charge phase. If you have any command abilities or disabilities in general that benefit you now, use them. It could be an aura of like rerolling charge rolls or something. I think like uh, the Maw Tribes have stuff with that, with their Beast Claw side of things. Then during the charge phase, say one of your units is going to charge. They have to be eligible though. If they ran, generally you can't do it. If you have the ability to run and charge, generally you can do it. They, that's it. That, that's it. And then you also have to be within 12 inches of an opposing unit. Now, there, there's some things where you get bonuses to charge, where, like, technically you can make a 13-inch charge, but if there's no one within 12, you can't. I'm so sorry. Then we go on to when you roll that charge roll. You don't have to take it if you don't want to. You know, you're not declaring it for anybody. That happens in 40K where they have to declare, like, oh, I'm going to charge X and X, X and Y unit. And they get a thing called Overwatch, where they get to shoot anyone trying to come in and get them. Age of Sigmar generally doesn't have that. There's, uh, off the top of my head, Sisters of the Watch, Vanguard Long Strikes, uh, Vanguard Raptors with Long Strikes and Stormcast. They got the sniper rifle. Uh, Free Guild Handgunners in Cities. And Fangs of Sotek can technically do it for a command point in that sub-faction for Seraphon. But, again, it's not really on the War Scroll. You, you get the point. Uh, not really a thing, so you don't have to declare who you're charging into. And if you don't like the charge roll, you don't have to take it, even if you could get into other stuff. And if you fail it, 
you can, if you have a hero in range or an ability to, you can re-roll it for a command point. Close combat phase, where all the action happens. Yeah, start a combat phase. If, if it's your turn, you get to do all your buffs for command points first. If you have any actions or can fight at the start of the combat phase, do it now. Then, your opponent gets the start of the combat phase. They get to buff their own stuff too. Then after that, you select your first unit for combat. If you're Lumineth Realm Lords, you get to select two. Almost no other army does this kind of thing. Some armies do have, like, their whole thing can fight in the start of the combat phase. Good for them. But we're just doing, this is normal. We're not going army specific one by one. We'd be here for five hours. We don't do that type of content here. But after you pick your first unit, your opponent picks a unit. And you alternate. Generally, they'll pick something that you haven't, um, attacked yet so they can try to get an edge on you somewhere else on the uh, the table and we go back and forth and back and forth end of combat phase you know because also during combat phase in the end of combat phase sometimes you'll have abilities to fight twice check your war scrolls to see when it's very important important other tips if your unit made a charge move in the turn they still get to pile in I will say an example here. Uh, it is the Iron Jaws here. Where, well, one, if you had two units, charge a unit, and then the first unit killed them. Like, uh, Gore Grunches killed a bunch of Free Guild Guard, but you also charged in a Maw Crusher to him. Maw Crusher made a charge. It's still eligible to, for a pile in for three inches towards the nearest enemy models. Also, if you're Iron Jaws, you can charge in the hero phase. You can do weird stuff with that if you're in range for it. And then you could actually have a little bit of a loophole where you retreat out, but because you still charge, you're still eligible for a pile-in. So if you want to, like, retreat over stuff with your big flying Maw Crusher, to fly over a screen to then pile into, like, some juicy hero, you can do that. Battle Shock. Not horribly important, but you know what? It's still there, so we'll talk about it. For each... And I'm going to read this, too, because I wrote it really nice, and I like my description. For each of the units that lost models during this turn, the player those units belong to rolls a d6. Again, it's this turn. It's not like, oh, they lost a bunch of models at the beginning of the game. This turn. Add that number that you roll in the d6 to the number of dead models for that particular unit and compare that number to the bravery characteristic of the unit on the war scroll. Right? If the number is greater than the bravery characteristic there, then remove models by how much greater the difference was. So, again, like, 10 dudes died on Bravery 6. Um, I'm losing D6 plus 4 models. All right? Instead of actually rolling, if you have an ability or the ability to spend a command point for a command ability from your hero, you can make your unit Battleshock immune and you don't have to roll the dice. You have to do that before you roll the dice, though, or else you're cheating. Scoring. Yeah, we're not done yet. Uh, end of the player turn. Uh, you check to see who actually owns what objective. Whoever has the most models on the objective, that's theirs. If there are objectives with no models on them, nobody owns them until you had a model on them to start with. You can move off it after you own it, and then your opponent has to move something on. But if no one's ever moved on to the objective, no one claims it yet. So, if it's your turn, you score points for the objectives you own. Your opponent scores in their turn, not yours. Yeah, no, I actually did that, but you do not score points yourself if it's your opponent. Yeah, it's bolded, highlighted, capitalized. Seriously, you score points in your own turn. Stop trying to tell people that you score in both turns. And then we repeat for the, uh, the bottom of the battle round for the other player's turn. Where they get the hero phase, movement, shooting, charging, close combat, battle shock, and then scoring. Yeah, that easy. One more thing. There will be things that happen between battle rounds. These are like moving endless spells, turn priority rolls, seeing if endless prayers still stay up. If you're playing something like, uh, like what we'll be doing in the example soon, shifting objectives. You got to roll to see which objective is important. If you're playing something like Star Strike. Where the hell do the new objectives come down? These happen between battle rounds, generally, or start of the battle, before players go.
And now, let's put it into practice. Hello, everybody. We are back here on TTS right now, Tabletop Simulator, to walk you through everything we just talked about. Because some people, they can read it, some people need to hear it, and some people need to see it. Unfortunately, can't have you in to experience it, but we're going to do the next best thing. Elm City is back, ready to help me out here as a wonderful assistant and director, and probably employee of the month if we didn't have a dog, uh, to walk you through everything we talked about. So if you remember in our last video, I actually said the smart thing would be to make Elm go. But I'm the teacher in this scenario, so I actually have to teach. So here we go. I'm going to take the turn. I'm playing Anvil Guard. They've got a cool ability that happens before the game. So before the game starts, we're going to roll a dice. And I'm going to get uh, D3 command points because that's just the, the trait I took on my general there. So I'm going to get two command points. Awesome. Also, before the game starts, we're playing Shifting Objectives, if you remember. Uh, we have two objectives. This is a thousand point game. One of them is going to be worth two points base. The other one's going to be worth one. We're on a four foot by four foot table here to accommodate the smaller point size of our armies. So I'm going to roll the dice on a one, two, three. This objective on my left is important. Four, five, six, the objective on my right is important. It's objective number one. I'm going to go and put this lovely aether cords here. I'm going to make it huge too because I sometimes can be an idiot. And why I'm smart is I know I can be an idiot, so I try to have things to help me out or be around people smarter than me so I can learn. And my thing that I've learned, I need a visual cue to be like, oh, this one's important, or else I'm just going to forget. Now I'm going to go on to my turn. Make myself a dice here. First things first, give myself a command point for showing up. Next, see if there's any buffs or anything I need to do in order to do my hero phase. There is. My sorceress gets a buff if she's... Kills a bleak sword and gives herself plus two to casting. We're doing it. So I'm going to, with my plus two to casting, try to cast the spell on my Sorcerer's War Scroll, Mystic Shield. Because all of her damage stuff is way out of range because Elm is all the way over there because she listened to my master class on deployment. I'm going to need a six, but I get plus two to this roll because that is a modifier. I get a six on the dice, so really that's an eight with my plus two which means my spell goes off. So I am going to get a little token, because again, I learned I need visual stuff. And you can buy tokens. I actually own tokens from like Amazon that I got really cheap in real life games, or for real life games. And I'm going to put this real links ones to save onto my big block of Black Ark Corsairs. Also, my uh, Black Ark Fleet Master in a city's army is near his adjutant. So on a four up, I roll a dice. On a four up, I get an extra command point. Nope, but I still have three, so I think I'll be all right. Uh, that is my hero phase. I have no other buffs to do. On to movement. I'm going to run the Black Ark Corsairs. We're going to, uh, you know, I'm going to do this the old fashioned. I'm going to hit R here and see what's up. That, that's a three. I know on the war scroll for my black arcs that if they have a musician, what they do, they get plus one of that roll. And on their war scroll, they move six inches base. So that is ten inches of movement on these merry, merry pirates. And I'm not going to take the full movement. It's more than enough for what I need. Great. Now I'm going to run with Cal the Charybdis. I said I was going to do this with an R key. Here we go. That is a two. He's going to move uh, nine inches, which... You see, is going to get him just barely tapping the objective. Cal, you couldn't have cut that closer if you wanted to. Next, my fleet master needs to keep up with the uh, the fleet there. So we're going to get a 5. He moves base 6 because he's an L, so he can go up to 11 inches. So we're going to be here having a very nice... Uh, he can affect everybody with his command ability if we get into the combat phase and get to fighting. Then I'm going to run my sorceress to see if she can keep up. Let's see if we can do some cardio here. She rolled a 5 as well. That's another 11. So I'm going to come up over here. The bleak swords are going to run. All right, let's do, well, we're going to move the chariots up out of the way. They can move up to 12 inches. I'm probably not going to be able to shoot them, even if I did do the full move, because, again, Elm deployed smart. So I am going to move to a central location with my hammers here. 
just to try to make sure that her deep striking, which are the uh, Grim Gas Reapers and the Dreads Inheritance, don't get easy charges off on them. I'm going to run my Bleak Swords. They have a musician as well and get plus one to this. So that is going to be an 11. These, these elves did leg day, let, let me tell you. So why I'm coming wide over here is, again, I'm going to be denying space from Elms Deep Striking. Then you're going to get the idea like that. And again, I don't want them coming in too far. So we'll do something like that. This last one's going to be probably something like this. Keep them off. So I've got a nice big old circle here. Uh, we're going to go on to the shooting phase, and I will measure from my units. Longest range on my stuff is 18 inches. No one is in range on any of them, even my most forward one. So great shooting phase. And then we're going to go on to charging. Uh, the units that didn't run in my army have no enemies within 12. I have no ability at the moment for them to run in charge. I could on the uh, swordsman in the back here, but again, they're way too far anyway. And I didn't spend the command point. And then we go on to combat. No combat. Then we go on to battle shock. No battle shock because no one died. Scoring, though, we can do that. Again, for my bookkeeping. There we go. I need visual aids. Work with me here. I have two objectives. I own the important one for two points. One of my battle line units is on there for the bonus point. I own the second objective because I have more models on it than my opponent. And also, Cal, for all the things he does, he's also battle line, as long as it's uh, Anvil Guard and I have the right general. So I'm actually going to score the max of five victory points. Nice, easy, done, and dusted here. Now, my opponent's turn in battle round one. So Elm, give yourself a command point for showing up. Perfect. Next, we're going to see any buffs that you can do. Oh, you do some passive buffs. Right now, you're going to try to cast the spell. Uh, uh, God, it's Neg 1 to Wound. It's a Night Haunt spell. We're going to go on to this in a second here. Uh, it goes off on a 6. That is a 4. That is a fail. Might go off on a 7. Either way, a 4 is not a 7. <sighs> She's got it written down somewhere. Don't worry. Either way, bad roll. Unfortunate. You hate to see it. But for me, you love to see it. Great hero phase, Elm. Movement phase. All right. I'm seeing the board here. There's ways to uh, try to take these objectives off of me without even having to fight. I only have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 elves on this one objective. That's a unit of 20 chain rasp board over there. We've got a unit of uh, 1 Charybdis. She needs two models on this point. Elm, roll me a dice for that run roll on these chain rask horde. Because sometimes you can steal objectives without having to uh, that without having to fight. And this Charybdis will probably mess up these chain rask horde. So just stealing it for free and forcing me to have to roll dice to mess up is what's important here. And Elm rolled a three. Elm um, also has the Pendant of the Fell Wind Artifact on her Spirit Torment to give a uh, plus three uh, movement to the Chain Rasp Horde. So they're actually going up to 12 inches because they have a base of six, if I remember right. So yeah, pick them all up. You want me to do it? All right, you roll the dice. Uh, going 12 inches. Again, you just need just two models touching. And we've got three. Oh my goodness, Elm, you've taken this point from me. And if I need to go and get this point, I have to overextend. And then my whole little box formation here to stop the deep striking breaks. Next, Chain Rasp Horde number two. Let's see what we get here, Elm. That is a five. That's close, but we need to make it a six in order to do what we talked about before in the show notes. So Elm is going to spend a command point from one of her heroes that are all in range, there you go, to automatically make that a 6. And again, so that's 6 plus 6 is 12, 13. They're going 15 inches. All right. 
15 inches. All 20 of them are on the point. She has taken this objective without having to fire a shot. Then we uh, we move this Dreadblade Harrow. Uh, moves uh, 12 inches base. Bus 3 is 15, but we don't need to move that far. We're just moving up to give the Feel No Pain over to these Chain Rasp here. Then we're going to run the Guardian of Souls, see how far it can go. Oh, that's a high roll. That is a 5. I don't remember how far. Let's say that's maybe like a 6 inch. So that's 11 inches you can go. Plus 3 from the Pendant of the Felwind. We're getting to where we want to go. All right, now the Spirit Torment itself is going to move up. And again, we're, we're trying to play this a little bit more conservative here. We don't even need to run that much. It gives itself plus three anyway. But all right, we're going a lot. But what we want to do is just move up to about like here-ish, Elm? Yeah? Okay. You can't hear her, but she's she's uh, looking at me. She's also my director, and there's also a whiteboard. There's show notes going on, folks. It's wonderful. Now, we're looking at all this. And we're like, okay, let's, what do we got here? So about nine inches away from my units as she's signaling for me to go and get this ruler. Be like, hey, I want to deep strike some stuff. She's like, my mouse isn't working. Go get my reapers for me. And I will. We're going to drop some uh, Grimgast Reaper over here. End of the movement phase stuff now. Again, this these uh, come in from reserve. Even more important, Elm knows not to fully commit to this because the moment she is out of units in reserve, I can break my formation and stop having to screen my Scourge Runner chariots. And then I can commit more of my forces. So are, are Dread Scythe Herodons expensive? Kinda. Am I also not using 200 points here? Yes. If I try to overextend though, will I be much easier for the Dread Scythe Herodons to kill? absolutely so great deep striking now night hunt will do their fame shooting phase that was it on to charging elm roll me two dice for these reapers because they didn't run they could actually charge here here we go no pressure i'm rooting for you need a nine that is a four if you had a command point you would spend it here to re-roll it but just so, for the sake of this demonstration, let's say that was a, uh, let's say that was a, a five and a four. Elm's amazing and never cheats at Warhammer. Uh, got the nine, didn't get the night haunt charge. Their allegiance ability where it goes off on a ten. That's all right. Elm's in the building. So we got these grim gas reapers up here. Now we're going to go show you, like, start of the combat phase stuff. If Elm had command points or heroes nearby, maybe she'd buff the, the Reapers. I, you know, she, she can't. Now it's my turn. I have plenty of command points. I'm going to spend the command point for the ability of my Fleet Master here. Give all these Black Arcs plus one attack on all their melee profiles. So any Black Arcs that survive will hopefully uh, deal with these Grimgast Reapers. Now Elm is going to... Start of the combat phase is done. Onto the combat phase. She elects a unit to pile in and fight. Uh, that's these Reapers. I will gladly help you out here. I'm going to get them all in. They pile in up to three inches towards the nearest uh, enemy models. For these, we're going to honeycomb them a little bit for a little bit of uh, extra uh, frontage. Even moving diagonally, it's still moving closer. So actually, I had more room there, more room there. Get that going and get in over here and I can move this Reaper up. You get the idea. Great, we're all in range. So nine Reapers are armed with the normal uh, blades there. That'll be 18 dice. Elm, hit that select all button. Pick them all up. Hover over the mystical uh, black hole there. All right, that's a great roll. Hitting on fours. Here's the thing though. Elm gets to re-roll ones, twos, and threes here. Why? There's an ability called Reaped Like Corn, where uh, if they go into a unit with enough models, the Reapers get to re-roll their hit rolls. You're killing me. All right. Fantastic roll from Elm. Now with six, 16 out of 18 hits. Great. Looking for threes to wound. 
You can hit that select all button a couple times. Make sure you got them. All right, shake it up for good luck. Drop them in. We're going to get rid of the uh, ones and twos here. That is 11 saves I need to make at negative one rend, one damage apiece. My poor, poor little black RX ain't do nothing to nobody. Have a five up save in combat. Now it's a six up. You apply modifiers after you roll the dice, though, but that's a discussion for another day. But I am rerolling ones to my save. So six up, rerolling ones is my functional save. I reroll the one, one. I reroll the one, one into a two. We get rid of the uh, the successes. Always pull your successes and leave the fails so your opponent actually can see what's going on so they don't think you're cheating. Ten dead elves, though. All right, well. I know I've lost the point anyway, and even with some uh, constructive piling in, I'm probably not getting it. So I'm just going to, for, for simplicity's sake, just pull these 10 dead elves. But wait, there's more. Elm gets to hit me with the uh, with one dice here, so we're going to just do it over there. With the bell toller, hit R for me there to roll that dice. Hits on a three. It hit. Wounds on a three. It wounds uh, negative one rend, if I remember right. Oh, boy. She's, she's smiling and jumping up and down here. All right, here we go. Six up. No. There's two damage. Two more elves get kabonged. And then the bell toller has a special rule. For each model it kills, it does a mortal wound. That means, they get that yeah, two more elves die. That, that That's the MVP of the unit there. All right, so we're at 14 dead elves and a dream. Now Rocco's going to come back and try to do a little something. I'm going to pile in up and along the nearest enemy model. I fight in two ranks because I am on 25 millimeter bases. So that's pretty much about the extra stuff that I get. I can pile in diagonally to try to get more bodies on the objective. And if this was a video on how to actually probably not lose this objective, I probably would have kept these models here to pile more in, but I still wouldn't have had numbers. So I'd rather just get attacks on the Grimgast Reapers themselves. I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Uh, one of them is actually the leader's dead. So that's going to make this a lot easier here. So. We're going to go up here. We're going to get 23 dice. And then we're going to remember, hey, Rocco, start of the combat phase. Spent that command point, bud. Doubled all their attacks. 46 dice. And because my unit has uh, 15 or more models still in it, I get plus one to hit. So we're hitting on threes with the sword profile on the, uh, on the Black Art Corsairs. No rerolls. But that was a great roll. Okay. Okay, now we're wounding on fours. Wounding on fours here. Alright. So that is 14 saves Elm needs to make. So she's going to go up there, make a 10 dice, and then we're going to get two more dice for you. Okay, roll them up, shake them. There you go. Alright, Night Haunt aren't affected by Rend. Not that I had Rend there anyway. We got, we're removing the successes. You needed a four up. So we're going to go. That is five dead Grimgast Reapers. Because we'd also check. Be like, hey, do you have a hero in range for that after save? We are just out. So that is five dead Reapers. But we're going to keep track of that. And then I'm going to go with my next profile. So again, that was 23... I deleted some dice to show y'all. Yep. I know, darn. But sometimes as a death player, you got to go for it, risk it for the biscuit here. But here we go. Now I'm going to go with my dagger profile because, again, I gave them the sword and dagger option for melee. Hitting on threes because of the plus one to hit. Wow, Rocco, you're amazing. But now... They're daggers. I'm wounding on fives. And that actually wasn't that bad. Eleven saves, Elm. I'll make you some dice. Here you go. 
No pressure, no pressure. Five are dead. Let's see if we can finish off the rest of them, boys and girls and animals of all ages. You're going to need to re-roll that up. You didn't pick them up. Just drop it. And roll, roll me this one, too, please. You just roll it with R. It's all right. Yeah, it's going to be funky. Hit R. That is a pass. Unfortunately for Elm, we're moving the successes here. That's another five dead. Darn. So, the lovely trying to go at me, Alpha Strikey, oh my god, you killed a bunch of my dudes. They out of here. I'll take it. <sighs> then, dun dun, Battle Shock. Alright, so let's say I didn't have a command point to automatically pass these Corsairs like I will do for real. So we're, let's calculate battle shock as if I wasn't going to. But we're going to spend that command point because I, I want to spend the command point for the sake of the game. So I've lost 14. It should be, if I remember right, they're, they're like bravery 6. This is how much I was already okay with passing the battle shock here. Uh, bravery 6, there's still a banner to make it a 7. I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 2, 4, 6, 8. 10, 2, 4, 6. Okay, so I get plus 2 for that. So we're at bravery 9. So uh, nine, 14 minus 9 is 5. The other way to do So I'm going to lose D6 plus 5 models if I wasn't going to auto, auto pass the, uh, the battle shock here. So I would lose 7 models. But I'm going to do the smart thing, spend a command point, keep my unit in the fight. Because I can't afford to lose another seven models. This this unit just, you know, shits the bed on me if I don't. Plus side though, Elm scored a good five points. So we're gonna put up five victory points. We have a tie game, folks. Now in between battle round stuff, again, this is shifting objectives. Elm, I want you to roll bring a dice to the pool. Yep. You're going to roll first to see where the objective goes. On 1, 2, 3, it stays. 4, 5, 6, it moves. You know, yeah, highlight it. Oh, you got to throw it? What are you doing? There you go. Hit R. There we go. It moves. It jumps. All right, now we're going to do a roll off here. I went first, so I break ties. Good luck, Elm. I got a three. You got a three. I break ties. I am not going to let you get the double turn. So I got to admit, I'm a little bit, uh, I guess I charge over here and I just hope I shoot enough. I don't know, but that's not what this video is about. So thank you for watching. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff. I got to say it. I'm a YouTuber now. I'm real. I'm a real boy, damn it. Class dismissed.